In some ways, doing live events and trainings is beautiful and elegant, but at one point, I just felt dead inside. And I remember seeing a dump truck drive by, wishing it would run into me. Meet Mike Keenigs, 15 times best-selling author. Here's a guy that's starting literally from nothing to get some of the first Mac games that existed, went out and became the guy to set up all those initial websites for Sony and for Columbia and for Fox. When the universe screams at you and says it's time to evolve, you either listen to it or terrible things happen. I probably reinvented myself seven times. I think there's a state in your life when you truly know who you are and accept who you are with no exceptions. That's when you don't care what anyone thinks about you. I want to be really clear to the audience. Not caring what people think is very different from not caring about people. Welcome everyone to another episode of Unlock Your Potential. Jeff Lerner, your host, always so excited to be back with you, having amazing conversations with amazing human beings. Today, we are joined by one Mike Koenigs. So a quick uh, aside or maybe disclaimer, I'm a little bit fan geeky in this moment because Mike Koenigs was one of my early, early inspirations when I first ventured into the world of digital entrepreneurship. I won't attend, uh, attempt to reduce him to merely, you know, the guy that I had metaphorically on my my posters on my wall at the time. He's done so much more than just inspire little old me. Uh, he is a serial entrepreneur, 17 time number one best-selling author. I thought it was a big deal just to write a dang book. He's written 17 of them that have been at the top of lists. He's a speaker. He's an online personality. He's an influencer. I'm not even going to read his biography. I'm just going to go from what I like know of him. He's like this... Mike, maybe cover your ears, don't get a big head, but like he's like this I'm savant-ish sure. guy who I've seen him do so many different things really, really well. Like like when I was getting started, he was, it, 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 there weren't a lot of like, you know, WYSIWYG graphic user interface things that made tech easy back then. You kind of had to like fiddle with it. And he, he was like one of the first guys that was making tech really easy for people that could do really to unlock the power of what you could do with it for people that didn't have technology backgrounds. I used uh, multiple of his programs back in the day, but he's also got this crazy resume. He's done some bizarre things. He's a cancer survivor. That's not necessarily the bizarre thing. Uh, he's he's chanted in a sarcophagus in the Great Pyramids with Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer. Uh, he, gosh, helped his wife make a documentary. Honestly, Mike, I feel like I'm not doing it justice I just That's wonder, right. like, can we just talk and you can just tell us about all the cool stuff? It's 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 fine. You know, people are like, yeah, tell me your story. I'm like, I don't know where to start. You know, right. tell me about you and then I'll tell you what's relevant. And, um, you know, my highest purpose is always collaborating anyway. I like making stuff with great people. And um, that's really I, what lights me up more than anything. I think that was true of you. So I first came across you. I got started in November 2008 in affiliate marketing and the program that I was involved in, it actually had some training modules and it integrated some of your programs. So I would have been exposed to you in 2009. And from what I remember of you in 2009, you were already collaborative because every time I saw you, you always had like one or two other featured experts or people that you were partnered with. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, where, I guess I'll ask you the same question everybody does. Like, where should we start? Well, around then, I think what probably lit up my my career was I was working with Tony Robbins and helping him out. And that just like snowballed. It was soon everyone was, you know, somehow kind of knew about me if you knew that business. But I guess the best place to start is usually in a way that's most relatable, which is, you know, what was wrong, what's been wrong, and how'd you get past the hump in a way that's relevant for your audience. And I was telling you this before we started that I probably reinvented myself seven times. Dan Sullivan and I do a podcast called Capability Amplifier. And our first episode was, tell me about your reinventions. And it was like, most of them have been bookmarked with a business, but each one reached a point where, you know, you'd have some purpose and suddenly it wasn't purposeful anymore. And I think when the universe screams at you and says it's time to evolve, you either listen to it or terrible things happen. You know, it's when addictions occur or some sort of self-destructive behavior. 
and all of us are living inside an illusion and a hallucination or someone else's interpretation of our hallucin or hallucination. So, and we're the worst at interpreting our own, you know, it's why we, why coaches need coaches mm -hmm. and why I think the higher of a performer you are, the, the more support you need. And yesterday I spent the whole day with uh, my good friend, John Asaraf, who's one of my walking buddies. Sure. And he's a profound, profoundly interesting thinker. And, um, we just worked on business stuff together and it's it's always collaborative. It's never like you do this for me and I'll do this for you. He just started pouring out genius material and he gave me some really big insights that I'd never thought of before. And I walked out of there feeling as though I had what you know the natives would call or the Buddhists would call a death experience. You know, I didn't recognize the person I walked out with compared to the person I walked in with. And um so I think everything tra should be a transformation. You know, if you're living a transformational life around transformational people, that's what lights me up. So I don't know if that gave you any more fuel yeah. for a better question, but let's keep on stacking until we get to a great destination. No, honestly, I mean, that's, that is the fuel, at least for me, what you said around, you know, when you, when you start to run thin on purpose, and I think mm -hmm. that, that word purpose like, like, I mean, I was, I shared with you a little before we hit record and the audience, most of the audience will be, you know, familiar with this for me that like my whole philosophy and foundation and even my whole business is around purpose-driven entrepreneurship and this concept of purpose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always say that I always quote Mark Twain, the two most important days in a man's life are the days born and the day figures out why uh, yeah. that's the purpose, <laughs> the, the day your purpose becomes clear, but we don't always get to choose like there's sort of this universal alchemy of like, well, you know, I will reveal your purpose to you once you've, you know, sufficiently suffered and endured uh -huh. and and are and are battle ready for the revelation of purpose, because I'm not going to reveal it to you to make your life easier. I'm going to reveal it to you to tell yeah. you what your life is so hard for so that you, and, it's, and it's probably only going to get harder. But then like, you're right, because it, it does sort of ebb and flow. And and actually, maybe I'll ask a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. You talk about when maybe you said in your life narrative, it's framed as business evolution, but it's obviously it's a lot deeper than that. But there's these moments where the clarity of purpose either, I don't know if it becomes opaque or thin or what, and then you have to pivot. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, yeah. you're going to you know die spiritually or literally or whatnot. Do yeah. you think that it's the purpose is is ever changing or do you feel like it's yeah. that in that moment whatever you're doing has has somehow been you know decoupled or or veered off course from purpose and so it's time to find some new way to get back on track yeah i i think um you know that old cliche statement what got you here isn't going to get you there um i also think that there's little containers along mm -hmm. the way right so if you fill up a certain container you know whether your interpretation the hallucination i choose to uh agree with is that i think god says it's full it's time to move on and um you know to create like everything is about creation and as so above so below right i mean everything is a fractal upon itself and unto itself and I think, you know, like as a child, you learn certain things and you see your parents a certain way. And then when you become a parent, you see yourself and your children a certain way. There's so many lessons. I think the more you absorb, give becomes a multiplier for what you have to give and offer. And the more you think, the more you collaborate, the more you create. These are all expansive, like the nature of the universe is it's constantly expanding. And, and so I think ultimately all these things are tied together. And I think if you are going to live in the image of your creator, that's what you do. Creators create. And whether you're making babies or you're making art or making music or writing books or creating useful products, or you're just helping someone see the divine nature of themselves when they can't see it for themselves those are all acts of deep spiritual work. And so, you know, what, what is a 
you know, the chrysalis and the butterfly are a, a chicken and an egg, right? The chick, it's got to get out of the shell. And I just think that the nature of evolution is what your previous evolution in some ways doesn't even remotely re resemble your prior one and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So we're constantly having to learn and relearn and see the universe through different eyes. At least that's been my experience. So, uh, so can I interject with uh, another, mm -hmm. another like kind of a, call it a paradigm question. Um, you're, you've said a couple things that are, all, I, I mean, I, a lot of the people I inter I interview on the show or talk to on the show, I actually don't love the word interview. I just like to have conversations, but yeah, for what it's worth. I agree. Uh -huh. um, that a lot of the people I converse with on the show, I you know, very, fairly aligned. We tend to tend to be that way. But you've said a couple of things where I'm like, ooh, that's that's beyond just like g general alignment. That's almost like mm -hmm. a little bit uncanny. Um, and and one of the things you talked about just now was that how you know creativity or or being in a in a creation space. You described it sort of as reflective of our createdness in the image of a creator, which I, mm -hmm. I, I align with that. But but I'll, I'll just share with you one of the things that I do that I think is unique uh, in within what I do is I try to apply like business logic to the totality of life. So I take all areas of uh -huh. life and break it into KPIs and you know key performance indicators and you know the whole like. What, what you you can't improve what you don't measure, right? And so measure everything yeah. and you can improve everything. But mm -hmm. one of those is I take the professional arena of life and and I and I organize it in what I call value channels. And my three uh -huh. particular value channels are finances, which is kind of how yeah. most people think of their professional life. And mm -hmm. then there's mm -hmm. authority, like your your your, you know, call it ability to impact across space and population. But the third, is creativity. I act yeah. that actually resonated for me a long time ago as like, and, yep. and it came through my work as a coach where I met a lot of people that seemed to have every other professional box checked, uh -huh. but they were miserable. Yeah, and, it, yeah. and I said, and I would ask, like, well, what have you created? What do you what 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 is it? What is it within your your professional category that bears your unique fingerprint that that mm -hmm, someone can mm -hmm. tell you were there and not someone else? And if yeah. they didn't have an answer to that, it usually aligned with this sort of inexplicable malaise. Mm. And so I have you're the first person I've talked about that's mm -hmm. called oh, yeah. out creativity so specifically in the context of their professional life mm -hmm. as as something mm -hmm. intrinsic. So I love it. Yeah. Well, it's it's um, you know I, I'm fortunate enough that I married a divine being. Um, specifically, my wife is a, uh, she is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. So she's a fascinating person. I also have the great joy of, uh, I, I love my um, mother-in-law and she just spent uh, a bunch of time with us. So you have a, she, you have a Jewish mother-in-law? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I was raised Catholic. Yeah. How, how and, archetypal. Uh, yes. Well, that's <laughs> precisely it. And so, um, she, she's met with multiple, uh, seers. I don't know how to put it any other way, but, uh, um, way beyond fortune telling I'll, I'll say, and what she, she often gets told is she, this is her last time around. Hmm. Um, you know, so if you believe in the concept of, of either reincarnation or energetic reuse or whatever it is, what they've told her multiple times is, you know, you've done your work. And she, um, mm. about 18 years ago, she woke me up in the middle of the night and said, I hear babies screaming in Africa and I, I see them dying in Africa. I'm going to do something about it. And I was like, first of all, you just say yes to a woman like my wife. <laughs> and um, so it wasn't too much later she was in Africa partnering up with a Catholic nun delivering babies by candlelight and then that led into building a foundation doing a bunch of philanthropic and work on the ground in Uganda which now is in India and she saved tens of thousands of lives and um, you know, I think it came from her pain, right? Her generational pain of having no living relatives. And um, 
growing up in a slum in New York, being horribly beaten and abused by her father, who just never got over, you know, his, he manifested a lot of pain that was inflicted on other people. Right. Um, and so her way of dealing with it, instead of caving into, you know, becoming an alcoholic or a drug user or, so, or worse, she decided to turn it into something profound. And, um, you know, I think part of the deep work that we need to do as human beings is to find a divine partner who matches us energetically. I think that's part of the quest. And it's not just about creating things and creating wealth, although I like keeping score, it's about finding that union, that partnership, that missing piece and meeting, meeting the divine through whatever pain, you know, your other half has been through. Um, you know, I think that's, I, I used this term a while ago. We're not human beings to be a human being is one thing, but to be a human expression is something orders of magnitude more profound. Hmm. What you you basically called out my my marriage and what's what's so profound and special about it. This mm. is um I, I've I've met that person. I mean wow. I'll just say that and we do How lucky we do, are you yeah, it's and I've been married three times, so I actually have a basis for better comparison. Get it, better get it right this time, huh, buddy? Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> if, if it's, it's this time or I'm out. But no, it I, and I did. I mean, you know, third time's a charm. I uh, yeah. we, we do work. We lead um, it, it, the advanced events in our company, Entra. We actually get to lead them, and we do tr mm. you know on site, you know, hands on transformational experiential work yeah. with our students and getting to serve together. In, in and and you know I can't always put it in these terms in the context of the work itself because we're not a yeah. faith based organization but I mean it's uh -huh. it's God's calling for our life it's just is right. and yeah. we're so much better at it together than we could ever be individually. How lucky um, are you? Huh? It, well, it is. It, so okay, let's you know I never know where these conversations are going to wind, but I love it. I love. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't walk in with an agenda. So no, uh, well, me neither. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, so okay, well then let's then let's talk more about maybe take us back, okay? Because by the way, you're mm -hmm. you're it's I love meeting the people that you you know had previously only known through mm -hmm. usually through our marketing is how people you know mm -hmm. know guys yeah. like us, right? So there's always so much more. And John Asaroff's another guy. I've, I've I know John probably not as well as you, but I know him reasonably well. And and again, yeah. there's just so many layers to great entrepreneurs. So often, yeah, um, take us truth. back though. Maybe like I'm always interested and I'll just ask the question directly. How did mm -hmm. you become the person that could become Mike Koenig's that we know today? Mm. Divine discontent. Um, I, like I hated being a kid. I hated where I was from. I was ashamed of my family. Um, I had no good reason to. I always liked my dad a lot. My, my dad grew up very poor on a farm um, in Iowa youngest uh boy out of out of eight kids really really beautiful family and my mom is the product of a philandering alcoholic fireman and a bipolar mother so um but they were great parents um i'm the oldest of four and um I, I was forced to go to Catholic school and I hated it. Like I never got along well with authority or rules. I'm not a good rule follower. Um, and, and I grew up in a little tiny town where I felt like an alien and, uh, and I didn't know it at the time, but I had very, very severe ADHD. And, and, um, my joke I often said is I was the kid who was last to be chosen to play baseball. And on the ninth inning, when they'd put me out to play in left field, I was catching moths with my glove as the ball rolled by and people were screaming at me and I'd look up and go, what? You know, it was like I I had a, I lived in a different universe. Yeah. Now I was also, um, I had 
a lot of skills and talents that are not useful or recognized in a in school like i i hated school and i i did everything i could to not go um and um uh, all i ever wanted to do is write software i taught myself to code when i was 14 and i started my first business when i was 16 and my goal was to get the hell out of eagle lake minnesota i just wanted to be a millionaire and um and my way of expressing it is I figured out technology at an early age. I always had a knack for figuring out how things worked. I got that from my dad. He gave me access to all of his tools. So I learned how to build things and make things and take them apart and put them back together. Um, we grew up hunting and fishing and, and raising foods. So I had quality survival skills. And um, my dad it was a barber. So he taught me how to communicate and talk to people. Um but as soon as I turned 18, I moved out and uh, I was financially independent when I was 16. The day I turned 16, I started working full time um, and had my own little businesses. So I probably at any given time had four jobs at once for until I started my first real company, which was uh, one of the first digital marketing agencies. So um, I had good friends. I knew how to play a bunch of instruments. So I played in some bands and, um, but always busy, never had, I, I was happy, but not satisfied. Like I just knew, I felt like I knew where I belonged, but I didn't know how to get there. And I didn't know how to be coached or be coachable. So it wasn't until, you know, many, many, many failures later um, and learning how to navigate a brain like this that I figured out how to tap into a certain type of genius um, that I, you know, I, I don't feel embarrassed to say I've got a certain unique blend of a genius. That's weird. Um, but I think people like me oftentimes wind up either in prison or, uh, or dead or addicts. So my audience, I've never, is gonna... I've never said it quite like this before. So, uh, <clears throat> no, I, I think, think I would have had the courage not that long ago. I, I love it, man. I, I really, I really appreciate your answer in a lot of ways. Some of which we'll, mm -hmm. you know, we'll talk about off the air, but like, okay. I, uh, my, the audience is going to roll their eyes because, oh, this is the part where Jeff, you know, Jeff starts talking about words and word origins. I, I do this a mm. lot, but, but you mentioned the word weird. I have to ask, do you know the etymology of the word weird? I think I've heard it before, but but help me out. I'm going to just it's say a, no. Tell me the a, word origin. I bet you it's awesome. It's so, yeah, it's one of my favorite words. So, okay. Because I'm a just full on weirdo and proudly, especially once you understand the word, it's like you're like, you're excited to be weird. So, uh, it comes yeah. from W Y R D, weird, uh, weird, it's like, oh. weird. It's, and it's, it's old English. And what it means is the ability to tell, to see and or change the future. Uh, and so like you've, you might have heard, like they'll talk about like weirding ways in like mysticism, like d divinity, like yeah. divining. Oh, yeah, of course. The d divining gifts are the weirding ways. And so. Yeah, yeah. No, so it's. Um, so what's cool yeah. about it is his, for most of human history, it was, you know, we lit, we historically anthropologically this the, the predestination concept is sort of humans always think like their lot is is fixed and you know the die is cast right and so yeah. it was very for most of human history it was actually a preposterous notion to suggest that you could actually influence your future by making mm. different choices in the present yeah so uh -huh. much so that they would burn people at the stake for it like it was considered uh -huh. weird but now yeah. that's what everybody's trying to do all the time. And yet, and yet we call it weird. And yet we're all trying so hard to be and constantly trying to shake off the shackle of our, you know, yeah. de determined past. So be weird, I, man, lean into it. Yeah. I think, I think, um, so this is another thing. Like I've got a 21 year old and, um, he's weird like me in different ways though, but he also something that he hated for a long time and he learned, he's grown to appreciate it and not yet be okay with, but 
I think there's a state in your life when you truly know who you are and accept who you are with no exceptions, that's when you don't care what anyone thinks about you. Mm -hmm. And when you can really, really embrace. So there's a difference between weird in the weirding way and and freak, right? Um, right. And and so, and and for the longest time, you know, someone, you know, either my son or my wife would say, well, what's going to so-and-so think? And I'd be like, I don't give five Fs. Rhymes with truck starts with an F, right? I'm not... I don't give one, not even a little bit. I don't care what anyone thinks of me. Not, not even a little. I know who I am and I'm just fine. And it's not my job to be liked. I'd rather be effective and I'd like to, I'd rather be at peace with who I am. And I don't need more time to be happy. I've almost died of cancer. I know what it's like to endure a lot of physical pain and not know what's going to happen next. And I don't need more time to be happy. Quality matters. That's the only thing that matters. And I'm already get, I already got a bonus round. I'm 12 years into bonuses. So yeah. Um, now I don't want to leave because I feel a responsibility. Um, and I happen to love this uh, hallucination I live in. I, I love this illusion as long as it lasts and um, it's delicious. Um, but uh, I think learning to embrace that and, and just be okay with who you are. And I think that creates such, you know, you just like what we're having right now. I mean, we haven't spent intense time together and in a way this is a performance, right? We're, we're, um, but we're having a real conversation about real things and, and it's not that common. Yeah. It's, it's not common for men to have intimate, real, meaningful, deep conversations and be absolutely vulnerable. Yeah. I, I will say, I mean, speaking, this is, I, I totally resonate around not caring what people think and it's, I want to be really clear to the audience, not caring what people think is very different from not caring about people. I care deeply about people. Yeah. And I know you care deeply about people. Mm -hmm. It's it's actually knowing that we care for people the best as who we are and who we were mm -hmm. created as and not giving anyone else permission to impede that by caring what they think, so to speak, is at least how yeah. I sort of process mm -hmm. what you're saying. But I, I, I'll just speak for me, and maybe you can, you know, tell me where you are. I, I literally, I don't know how to do small talk anymore. Like I, I, every now and then, I find myself a little bit, and I'm like, I just want to go to bed or mm -hmm. get on the computer. This is these are the only conversations I want to have, and I get to do transformational work with people all the time. Like I'm holding space for people, and mm -hmm. you know, you know, holding, you know absorbing energy and dealing with unpacking trauma. And like, I just feel so alive in a way that I like, do you, do you, do you ever find yourself? I, I don't know. How, maybe I'll just say, ask you, cause I feel like mm -hmm. we're, we're similar. How do you deal with what passes for normal life in the world when it's so shallow? I just get up and walk away. <laughs> okay. But Karen, yeah. yeah. I just have no tolerance for it anymore. I'll, um, uh, yeah, I'll just say I, I, I have no interest. This is a relationship I have zero interest in participating in. And I'm just going to, I'm going to take care of me because it's the right thing to do. And did don't, that, it's not you, it's me. Did that um, shift dramatically just, after your, your cancer fight? Uh, you know, I think it kind of started, um, you know, I, if, if you've ever heard of or read uh, Louise Hayes' You Can Heal Your Life book, that is essentially about the emotional causes of physical disease and how they manifest. And uh, like liver disease or lung disease or heart disease are all diseases, emotional diseases, and they manifest. Um, now, that may or may not be true. I choose to believe it is mostly true. And I know people who have certain mental behaviors that seem to get themselves into certain physical situations, you know, how they're pain. And there's a, I can't remember the, there's a person who 
um, basically he de-traumatizes physical pain by healing emotional pain. And I forget the guy's name right now. Joe Polish talks about him a lot. Um, I just think there's a lot of truth to that. And so the answer to your question was, this has been a gradual thing. And I told you this right before the camera roll that about seven years ago or so, I had sold Traffic Geyser instant customer. I had started you everywhere now. And a lot of that business was dependent upon doing paid traffic to a webinar to sell a $2,000 information product, which led to a $5,000 live event, which led to a $25,000 mastermind, which led to blah, blah, blah. Escalation model where the typical business model is it's a loss leader for two stages. Mm -hmm. And you monetized when you got people to your live thing. And that was like, it's in some ways doing live events and trainings and all that stuff is, is beautiful and elegant. It's a combination of art and psychology when it's done right and done with ethically. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we know the difference between the two, but at one point I just felt dead inside. And I can remember when I had it my worst, I, I couldn't sleep. I was having anxiety attacks and I remember looking up, I was, uh, and, and, you know, again, I'm not saying this to brag, but to, to illustrate, I had a place on the beach in La Jolla, California, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I'm driving the car of my dreams at the time. I've got, you know, my wife and I had figured out a lot. I've got a kid, you know, like a lot of stuff's okay. You had and the I, life that everybody's fighting so hard to get. Yeah. And yeah. that on paper looked good. And and I remember seeing a dump truck drive by wishing it would run into me because I was in so much pain that I could not explain. I could not articulate. And I didn't have the courage to talk about it because um, my quality of life was dependent upon someone believing I was a guru. And if a guru didn't have his act together... Um, then you'd be abandoned. And I was afraid that if word got out that I was such a wreck. So there was no, I couldn't be real. Yeah. And um, even the people I respected deeply who came to me for advice, I couldn't, I did not feel safe telling them how much pain I was in. And I, I didn't even know it. I just knew I felt wrong. And, and so I did some pretty intense, deep work and um, eventually got through it. And it took a while. And I also, I didn't realize it at the time, my hormone levels were jacked. And I had, you know, some anomalies in my blood. You know, it was like a bunch of stuff that had shown up. But again, you know, it's like the old, the classic situ situation of a frog in boiling water, right? right, um, right. I didn't know I was boiling to death. So um, back to answering your question, I think, you know, you I evolved into it. But I remember one time... I was terrified that like I would quote unquote lose it all, but it's, it's more visceral, more animal than that. And I can remember I was just, I, I was having a hard time catching my breath and breathing and my wife and I told her something and she said, you're a multimillionaire. You have, if there's one thing I know about you, you can reinvent yourself. You'll figure this out. You could quit working. We'd be fine for years. And I don't need any of this anyway. And I've never given myself permission to, to even believe that to be true. So I'd been living inside a trauma loop probably for the better share of 30 years, which I believe to this day is probably a multi-generational trauma loop that was passed on through my family, you know, of origin, you know, I'm, I am the product of multiple generations of poor people and uneducated people, you know, high school educated and before that, not educated. Um, and I think that, that, that trauma gets passed on and we become sensitive to it. And, you know, a story gets passed on that we're not aware of. Right. So, and anyone who's done plant medicine yeah. will know that 
also if you've done your done your deep work and uh had a true ego death um you know what it's like to see the origins of the universe so okay so oh god there's, there's so much rich soil here and only not enough time to <laughs> till it all do um, your best i talk too much there you no, go no 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 is this is so good so good um so the you talk about running inside a trauma loop for 30 years i'm and, and then you you know tie it to to ego death i i feel like there's and again, this this is this is the work I do, right? Like a lot, you know, people know. It's, I'm sure you've lived this too, or like people think they know who you are, what you're about, what you're passionate about, what's important to you, why you do what you do, because they saw some ads with you in them or something, right? And it's like yeah, you get whatever. to know the person, and it's it's I don't want to say it's deeper or, or better. It's just very you know often very different, right? Uh -huh. So you know, a lot of people think I'm you know online business guy, and really, it's like for me the funnel. It's not you you talk about the ascension model. I'm not trying to ascend the the economic value ladder, although as a practical matter, that's maybe how you have to build a business. I'm trying to ascend the the depth of experience ladder with people, right? Like my yeah, the reason I right. want them to click the ad to buy the little seven dollar thing is because someday I want to be like, you know, in a circle with them while they work mm -hmm. out, like you said, multi-generational, you know, epigenetic scarring from whatever and and um, yeah. you know and that's that's what is my currency so yeah. but so often there's this i'll call it like a uh almost like a a meta a meta evolution of a human right where they have yep. we inherit and or experience things that create trauma loops yeah those trauma loops drive us they st very often you know they manifest as like everything as assets and liabilities Mm -hmm. Often the you know Pete when you meet people that have that drive that intensity to do outlier things it's very often driven by some amount of that trauma and then often that gets them to a place where either existentially or experientially or for whatever reason it's time to sort of face it the crucible mm -hmm. moment then they face it then then it then they change and truly what got them here it's not that what got them here won't get them there it's that what got them here is transmuted into some new thing to take them elsewhere. Yeah. And then a lot of times within that, they start to orient towards different currencies like purpose mm -hmm. and calling and service. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you're describing your version of that. I'm gonna just say yes. Uh you know, the it's it is every human hopefully gets to experience a hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And uh a friend of mine. I, I got to find these damn books, but there's, um, and I know I'm going to butcher this, but just bear with me with the concept. Cause I know the concept is accurate. The words I'm using might not be. But and and I just to, real quick, I do want to say for everyone, yeah. like if you aren't familiar with the hero's journey, mm -hmm. go, you know, learn about Joseph Campbell and learn about the hero's journey. Yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. Every yeah, great yeah. movie is a hero's journey. Right. you like toy story. What a hero's journey. Uh, every great Pixar movie is a hero's journey. It's it's the birth and resurrection. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's the Jesus Christ. It's the Christ myth, what's also known as the Christ myth. But apparently this is this is so this is for masculine form. So um, I'm not speaking gender specific, even though uh, I don't like going down that rabbit hole. But what's important is for the masculine journey, apparently around age 14 we have a saturn phase that is the proving time and men who miss their saturn phase have another opportunity to reach it again usually around 27 to 30 something and then again in their 40s and um you know it in our society at least this now now especially worse now there isn't a call to a calling that occurs. There isn't a phase where the, the brave goes out to have their first kill, their first hunt. And again, I'm speaking uh, metaphorically, but also I think there's something to it. Um, and a buddy of mine was just over for dinner last night um, and he played this video of a woman talking about uh, masculine and feminine relationships 
and how um and she went on on and on about you know uh paternal not paternal what's it what's it called when you have a over masculine relationship uh pati- it's pati- it's basically when men own women but it's like not pa- like patriarchy that. patriarchy yeah okay, yeah but she basically was talking so that's about that's a hot word these days oh yeah but in this particular instance she was using it in the sense that of embracing a certain kind of patriarchy um to serve one another because it's 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 normal and it's to be celebrated but she said something very profound that's either going to just spin someone in the right wrong direction or they're going to get it which is it was it's her job to f the war out of her man so to to create a safe home yeah what well, that, that, that makes perfect sense it, it yeah. does to me as well. Yeah. It was like, holy cow, I'd never thought of that before. And it was like, because because it's part of it is the the feminine energy loves the strength and the power and the protection. And, uh, you know, and part of her perspective, which I happen to agree with, is that we're so out of balance right now. But it, it also comes from the fact that there is no rite of passage they've been destroyed by the state and by um a uh, massive disinformation well um, and by and by society's generalized addiction to comfort yeah i yeah. mean i was I'm, i was raised yeah. jewish i was bar mitzvah at 13 there was yeah. a time that that or equivalent you know moments in in human you know development it was like some heavy shit that went on you yeah. know what you know what happened for, to me around my bar mitzvah no, I got a bunch of presents. We sang. I, I like had to do some dorky thing in the temple for yeah, like uh-huh. a, an hour, and yeah. went to like read us read a speech that like I had had proofread nine times, and there was no risk at all. And then right, we right. had a party in a hotel. I got some presents. the The girl that I had a crush on rejected me. It wouldn't dance with me, so I danced with another mm-hmm. girl that I felt you know like eh, okay, whatever, because I don't want to mm-hmm. be alone during Stairway with Heaven. It's nine minutes. It'll be awkward. Like, oh uh, yeah. This is the shit I remember when like hundreds uh-huh. or thousands of years ago, men, like you say, men were out like, okay, I'm going to, you know, nine nights alone in the wilderness and I'm going to eat the buffalo yeah, yeah. or whatever. Right. Like we don't right, do right. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's clear, you know, um, you know, weak men create hard times. Yeah. And, um, and my son, you know, like he was raised with a Jewish identity um, I, I married into the tribe. That was one of the agreements, uh, which I, I've embraced. I just, I always say the best way to add more joy is to add more Jews. Like I just, uh, I happen to love, uh, Jewish identity and I, I, I don't need to convert. Like I don't need to be part of any, anything. I just happen to love the experience you know the the complexity of the culture um but uh and my son was bar misfit at the great wall and gave all his money to build a library in uganda and you think holy crap how profound but you know he's a privileged kid first generation raised where we didn't um we didn't deny anything and we suffer the consequences for that now we gave him uh we gave him an easy life because we didn't and uh so we we did we did the disservice of what uh first generation wealth does to their children yeah um so you know i i think um these are not easy uh except you know no matter what the cross you bear that's what you focus on and whatever you you do with that you know it it's an opportunity to focus on something, get to a, a destination and do something magnificent with it. And it's like we interpret our story and to to interpret it with an ending that's meaningful to someone else is part of the gift. You know, it you don't have to have had the worst life to be able to create profound change. I think it's just fine to be normal and um, not have lived through all that and not feel like you missed out on something. I don't recommend going through what I went through, nor going through what my, my parents went through Mm. or 
anyone else. You know, there I'm not comparing anything. I'm very, very uh happy that I had what I had and that I've come to terms with it. And I well, hope I, I hope I can give the same to my son. Yeah. I mean, I I obviously didn't suffer, you know, in that sense of growing up, but I, I think that you know, I, I totally agree with you. Like to, and, and I think this is a huge fallacy in parenting and in just like general human treatment of others that somehow we we have this obligation or or morally justifiable imperative to create suffering for others yeah. <laughs> to like toughen them up or teach them some less as you know, basically to play God with other people's pain. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. because my experience is that the universe will take care. The universe will find a way to deliver whatever amount of suffering, whatever type of suffering is essential for a person's development without needing anybody else's help. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that true? Hey there, it's Jeff. So real quick, I want to let you know about my text message community. I use text messages to provide unique value to the Unlock Your Potential community. These texts could just be random thoughts. It could be letting you be the first to know about an event I'm planning, maybe giving an update on a special I'm running or some free training that I host for my community. Anyway, just shoot me a text to get subscribed to the list. The number is 702 996 3926. Again, that is 702-996-3926. Let's get back to the podcast. Okay. So uh, as we, as we run short of time here, yeah, maybe let's come current for mm -hmm. Mike Koenigs and you talk about whatever, whatever cross we have to bear at any given moment. Um, and I, I'm going to, I don't want to butcher a paraphrase, so I'll just say it in my words, but you, you know, essentially what I took from what you said was that there's this uh, opportunity, maybe maybe a calling to to be taking whatever it is that we're we're bearing in a moment and be trying to create or extract meaning from which we can learn and share with others. So, mm -hmm. what is that for you right now, mm. based on where you're headed? Do you have a sense? Well, um, so we're at a phase right now. We're recently empty nesters. Our son is more or less on his own. We are building property in Baja, Mexico. Vivian and I love Mexico. We just love Latin America and uh, um, the Baja specifically. So we're near Chip Conley's MEA, Modern Elder Academy. Oh yeah, I've had Chip on the show. I love Chip. He's one of our favorite people. So we're a next door neighbor to him hmm. and um, developing nearby and then we also are building um, a property in Malaga, Spain, where I have a couple of team members. So I've got an international team now. I've got developers in Poland and Germany and a uh, creative team in Spain. And um, we're working on building a lot more international relationships all over the place. And so, and Vivian's foundation is self-sustaining at this point. She's lucky enough that uh, a couple of her donors gave her NVIDIA stock. Um, so that's kind of nice. Yeah, uh, really. so that's been taking care of itself in, in, in some ways, she, you know, you, after doing it almost 20 years, it is hard to raise money. And I, one thing I tell people who come in and they're like, oh yeah, and I'm going to, I'm going to create a nonprofit. And I'm like, that's a horrible idea. And I can give you a hundred reasons why you shouldn't. Um, it, but one of them is it's an enormous, it's a, it's more than a full-time job with a target on your back. Um, and never remember or always remember the F the IRS is not your friend, nor is the state. Um, so um, we are spending our time now creating our happily ever after hmm. creating international deep relationships uh, as much purpose as possible and spending as much time uh, creating intimate relationships. And then I'm endlessly fascinating, uh, fascinated by writing books, creating products and content, collaborating. I speak a lot. I'm just heavy into AI and I've never felt more creative or abundant than, than now. Um, I wake up every day with a creative partner who can keep up with me and it's fun. It's just fun. It's incredible. Well, I, uh, like I said, I, I guess in 2009, so 15 years, I've been tracking your journey. Wow. I will say, and 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 I hope there's a, a 
a thread of inspiration in this that, you know, 15 years ago, I was a guy sitting at home, half a million dollars in debt. I mean, it's such a cliche type of story now, but like, yeah, yeah, you know, just trying to learn some stuff. And I came across you and to, mm. to think, okay, 15 years later, I'd be meeting you as a peer, you know, on the, on my podcast. Like, it's just, it like this stuff. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a little bit of a fatalism in the world now. I was actually hearing, mm -hmm. I was listening to Jordan, Jordan Peterson this morning. Um, I don't remember who he was talking to, but they were basically saying that like most people in the world today have fundamentally sort of given up. And oh, it was when they were talking mm. about crypto and they were talking about all these meme coins mm. and just the, the inflows into these meme coins where every, and, and it was, we saw it with NFTs a few years ago where everybody's like- All the gambling. Uh, is yeah. Every, yeah, we live in a society of gamblers now because they're like, well, if, if the mm -hmm. odds are better than a lottery ticket, then I can, you know, then it's better than a lottery ticket, right? Yeah. Because people Find new friends. Just, yeah, yeah. I mean, people That's just what I up. say. Yeah. And I, I say that. What? Yeah. Like, That's there's, interesting. there's real opportunity out there still. And if there wasn't, I, I wouldn't be here interviewing you, is my point. Yeah. Well, here's, uh, I don't have social media on my phone. So uh, I don't touch it. I, I have other people doing it for me. I just filter and insulate myself from, you know, the way I, I tell it when I'm on stage, I'll say, I know the perfect way to not get sick. Don't lick toilets. So keep, don't watch the news. And, you know, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook are evil. I, I, X is all also, I think YouTube is the least evil of the platforms. Um, and I use it every day to, to learn and educate, but I do not allow anything to create a, uh, playlist that I absorb. Yeah. So, um, I do not give my attention in a way and those who are miserable gave their attention away and they don't value their time. When you don't value your time, you don't value your inner, you don't value anything. So, um, and you got to remember that th those things are programmed to steal your time and sell you stuff. So advertising is for idiots. Um, you know, anyone like to me, if you don't pay for YouTube, you're allowing someone to steal your time for the illusion of saving $20. Right. I oh, value yeah. my oh. time at $10,000 an hour. So I, I look at everything through hard black and white, and I do not live in the mushy middle. It's yes or no. There's no middle anymore, and I'm happier for it. I have hard rules. Now, I walk away from people, places, and things that create aggravation. Um, so that's a longer story, and I know you got to wind this one down, but I uh, I think that's the deal is is that line of thinking. I used to like Jordan Peterson and um, I don't know if I respect him anymore. Huh. I think he's a miserable old man. There's nothing that there's nothing about him that seems joyful or happy. And uh, I don't want to be around it. No, I he's, respect him. He's definitely carrying, carrying a load these days. I, I will, yeah, I will give you that. Well, listen, I, I actually think that was a really profound note to end on talking about yeah. not licking toilets and not being on the receiving end of algorithms that trade your attention. And that was yeah. pretty powerful. So let's leave it yeah. there. Uh, Mike, how can the world, I, I know you're not on social media, but you said you have a team that is. Oh, so I'm how can on the world it. go find I'm you? I'm on it. I just don't, uh, if you want to get to me, there's, right. a, there's other ways to get to me, right? Um, <laughs> but I do pay attention to it. I just have someone else filtering it. So I don't, spend my time there again i can i can pay someone a lot less than ten thousand dollars an hour to manage that stuff right. so i'm going to focus my energy on high value things so how do you get hold of me like one of them i have a platform right now i built that um you can have a copy of my new book for free if you want and i this platform it's called uh it's digitalcafe.ai and it's a tool i built that will ask you questions and learn about you and then send you a digital synthetic mic who will talk to you, um, an audio and a video. And it was designed as a marketing platform, but it's also a way I pay attention to every single content that comes through there and pay attention to what you talk about. And then you can have my book and an audio book for free. So um, 
I think that's the way is just let's start a conversation and you can meet me that way and I will see you. That's very cool. Digitalcafe.ai. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Any, uh, any parting thoughts? Well, first of all, thanks for just going deep and real right away. I didn't know what to expect because I, I, I did prepare and um, I thought about our conversation today and it took a delightful twist I hadn't expected. And I, uh, I want to just acknowledge you for being courageous and asking hard, deep questions and sharing yourself also. And that's, um, it's really a gift to, to be raw and real. I feel the same. Thank you. Thanks, brother. And to all you viewers and listeners, it is a gift. Be raw and real. No, no, as, as Mike alluded, no fucks given. Yeah. Uh oh, that's right. No, seriously, though, you are the best part of this show, all of you out there. And I'm so grateful for you. So glad we got to spend this time together. Can't wait to see you on the next one. Take care. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. Don't buy this story that you haven't got any free will. You have. You're not a machine. You're not predestined. This is the way in which we now think, oh, we're all just cogs in a machine. But we are not.